Anybody want to jump on this? I see if I can put it on. It's PDH, but you're not registered for it. Okay. Hi everyone, this is Shana Schwartz. If anyone um, is viewing and needs a PDH who didn't register, I can actually I can help with that. So just um, I'm going to put my email in the chat. Um, and especially if we've got people watching in a group, just make sure we're staying on mute. And uh, presenters, if you're ready, I think we're good to go. I think so. Hey, let, let me. Uh, it's Ricky Holston with Sunrise. I'm the webinar for the Arizona Water Distribution Committee. Um, thanks everybody for coming out today for the um, for this June webinar. Um, we've been the distribution committee has been doing webinar trainings in lieu of live in-person trainings during COVID. Um, we've had pretty good attendance, so we might be something that we continue in the future. Um, and as a result, you know, um, after watching these, if you have input about stuff you want to see, um, that would be greatly appreciated. You know, we can try to get some guest speakers in that to fit the um, fit some topics that are timely um, for things that you have, might have going on in your own systems. Um, today is Wes Murray with Hayward Flow Control. He's going to do um, plastic valves for. Um, and different applications in the water and wastewater applications. Um, but before Wes goes, Wes, go to next slide. Um, Mitch Ray is going to talk from Rockwell Automation. Last week, he presented and his team presented on um, digital smart transformation of the water systems um, throughout the valley. Um, or not throughout the valley, but just the nation, or what any things we can do with technology. Um, so, Mitch, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Ricky. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is again Mitch Ray with Rockwell Automation. Um, I'm part of the uh, water wastewater group here, um, but just wanted to give a just a real quick recap on what we covered um, on last month's uh, presentation, and then just wanted to share some information coming up, including a uh, recording of the presentation that uh, Shane was able to get uploaded to YouTube and made a little bit more of a friendly short link that everybody could remember versus. Uh, a very randomized uh, uh, YouTube link that everybody gets. <laughs> so um, we um, we wanted to be able to really just kind of cover what all goes into smart water solutions when we think about digital transformation. And that was everything from really analytics that you, you can get out of uh, systems, whether it's straight, um, you know, directly harvesting from the devices or um, other uh, software um, um, you know, software solutions that exist out there, uh, everything from diagnostic to predictive to prescriptive, um, also system reliability programs and condition monitoring. And then the the later part of the, the presentation really went over, um, you know, kind of some items that are kind of near and dear to everybody right now in terms of um, uh, remote, in, uh, you know, remote operations and how to, you know, keep your network secure um, when you have um, employees that are remoting in or engineers that need to remote in to troubleshoot. So SCADA and cybersecurity uh, was definitely a uh, talking points that we went over and a luck, we we're lucky to have uh, Janine Nielsen and Dean Scheidt from our team to be able to cover that. Um, just want to give a quick heads up on the 24th uh, next Thursday. Um, you'll notice the, the title is very similar to the one that we had. I will promise you that it is different content. Um, I think uh, we just hit the hit the right uh, word track for for titling on the uh, webinar for next week, but that's being presented by our uh, our uh, industry manager uh, Kelvin Hurdle, who covers all of North America as well as uh, two of our um, two of our uh, us, um, industry um, well two of his direct reports that are also part of the water wastewater group that um, are both on a tech more of a technical consultant role that will be presenting on um, uh, digital transformation within uh, in smart water uh, so that's coming up next Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific. And then um, I just want to make mention of the the short link here that I created a bit. That's a bitly link that is a legitimate link. It's not a spam or anything. Um, just trying to make the the ending um, uh, easy to remember. So if you go to bit.ly backslash Rockwell water, um, that will take you to directly to the uh, YouTube uh, site where Shannon had uploaded our uh, live recording of the presentation for last month. So in case you have time and want to check it out, be greatly appreciated. 
Hey, Mitch, question. So how does Rockwell fit into supplying smart transformations? Um, do you guys have software or um, have everything? You guys plan it all out and just put yeah. a box on the wall and have turnkey solutions? I mean, I kind of talk a little bit about that. Sure. No, th thanks, Ricky. Um, yeah, so we uh, so we are we have kind of a multifaceted um, uh, part of our business. We can we obviously supply the the equipment. We do have our own software, but we also do have um, our solution partners that we can uh, be able to create more robust uh, solutions for if it's you know anything from, um, you know, from kind of our core equipment like PLCs, MCCs, uh, VFDs, um, and then getting into more of the um, more of a plant level uh, software solution to an enterprise level soft uh, software solution and that can be everything from um you know we have uh like our factory talk uh, family of of uh, softwares that have a lot of different things from um you know we've gotten more into well we have our, our software packages that run um you know uh, mes solutions and, and, and SCADA uh, but then also getting more into recently with augmented reality and um and being able to help with um, a lot of our manufacturers that are, are looking for, well, I should say manufacturers and just customer entities in general, uh, being able to provide them more tools as we're still kind of in a, people are starting to open up and getting back to kind of what was normal, um, but being able to still allow for, um, you know, better tools for remote operations. Um, but we do work with a wide variety. We have capabilities internally for, um, for integration and panel building. Um, in case if there's like, uh, you know, if there's not a the preferred system integrator that you're working on projects for, but we really kind of take care of everything from, um, from being able to provide the actual equipment to building full, um, building panels and then also uh, commissioning a startup. Okay. Awesome. So it sounds like you guys cover the full gamut and then can literally, if someone needs to get up to the 21st century, call you guys up and have you analyze their system and you guys can take care of, you know, Absolutely. give them a pathway forward, if you will. Okay, awesome. Well, Mitch, we appreciate your uh, presentation and uh, we're going to go on to this month. All right. Thank you so much, Ricky. Thank you, everyone. Wes, take it away. All right, let's do it. Thank you, Ricky. Uh, and thank you everyone for attending today. So I'm Wes Murray. I'm with Hayward Flow Control. Uh, Hayward Flow Control is based out of uh, Clemens, North Carolina. That's where all of our manufacturing is done. Hayward is a thermoplastics manufacturer. Uh, thermoplastics, That's these things typically show up on chemical feed part of the uh, the process, be it water or wastewater. So these materials are going to be PVC, CPVC, uh, maybe PVDF, uh, PTFE, a lot of the plastics. Um, and so this presentation today is going to talk about some of the equipment, the nature of the material, uh, where these things are installed and that type of deal, just to give you a good understanding of of uh, some of the nuance to this. So in this picture here, these are a few of the core products that Hayward manufactures. Um, ball valves, butterfly valves, that's a huge part of, uh, of what Hayward makes um, and what we manufacture there in uh, North Carolina. These are, these are core components of any chemical feed system that you'd find in a municipal water or wastewater treatment plant. These applications are gonna be like uh, sodium hypochlorite, um, sodium bisulfide, uh, ferric, those corrosive chemicals where if you were to use metal, that metal would corrode. The plastic is corrosion resistant and holds up to those uh, corrosive chemicals. So some of the key things when you look at this picture here, some of the key things that you want to look at and notice are it's not just the plastic material either when you're dealing with this equipment. There's also, uh, like in the butterfly valve that you see there, there's also a rubber liner that that disc seats into. So understanding the material characteristics of not just the plastic, but also that liner uh, in the butterfly valve, very key to understand because of the corrosive chemicals at play. Same deal on the ball valves that you see there. Uh, it may be a little bit tough to see, but those black rings right over around the valve ports those are elastomer 
or rubber O-rings that create a sealing surface between the pipe connection and the valve body. Uh, this is uh, this is a shot that I actually took yesterday at one of our local water treatment plants. Uh, just to just to, I guess highlight one of the applications where this thermoplastic material uh, comes into play. So this is on hydrofluorosilic acid um, fluorides dosed into the into the drinking water for uh, tooth decay prevention. But you can see this is uh, CPVC material. CPVC has inherent characteristics that help it withstand like uh, impact resistance and sun exposure, UV resistance, uh, that kind of thing. You've got some basket strainers there, a uh, ball valve, a ball check valve. So in this application here, behind that wall, you can't see, but behind that wall, there's two 20 foot, 25 foot tall storage tanks. So trucks will pull up, uh, the delivery trucks will pull up, they'll uh, connect onto the, um, the inlet there, the hydrofluorosilic acid will move through that ball valve, through the basket strainer, and then into those massive storage tanks for on-site storage at this water treatment plant. This is a, uh, one of the city of Mesa water treatment plants. This is in their sodium hypochlorite room uh, the sodium hypochlorite is going to be used for disinfection. Uh, this facility, they actually generate the sodium hypochlorite on site, but uh, this is uh, this is part of the distribution uh, process into the plant. So as the as the raw waters come in, brought into the plant, treated, um, and then uh, then they apply the disinfectant so that there's a residual so that as this water moves out into the distribution network, there's some residual disinfectant present uh, so that you don't get microbial growth. Uh, that way, when you open your faucet, you've still got uh, clean drinking water that's free of uh, microbial growth. Uh, this is a city of Mesa, uh, same, same water treatment plant, but this is on, uh, I believe their polymer feed system. So same type of deal as the hydrofluoric, hydrofluorosilic acid uh, picture. On this one here, delivery trucks show up. They connect into these uh, banjo fittings there. Those Hayward ball valves are there just as isolation valves, and that feeds into massive on-site storage tanks. So again, this thermoplastic material, corrosion resistant to the chemicals that are present in a treatment process. This is, a, this is a picture of Hayward filter vessels. This is actually at a, uh, a magnesium site up in Utah, but this is on their ferric process. So one of the byproducts of uh, producing magnesium is this ferric chloride. So in this process here, these filter vessels are used to uh, filter the ferric before it gets loaded onto rail cars and then shipped throughout the country. I included this picture because I wanted to show you all some of the nasty applications that this thermoplastic material is put into and some of the environments that these things have to hold up in. So it's not just chemical exposure, but it's also extreme heat, extreme cold. Again, this is up in Utah, northern Utah area. So uh, where this plant's located, it gets hit by some pretty cold temperatures in the wintertime. It's out in the sun too. So thermoplastic material, the nature of its recipe or ingredient list, it has to hold up to these environmental conditions too, in addition to uh, the chemical exposure. This is a picture that I mocked up just to uh, illustrate the strength of certain thermoplastic material. So especially in the mining industry, there's a perception that plastic is cheap and it's just not going to withstand the abuses of industrial environments. But nothing could be farther from the truth. Uh, this valve body here that you see in that picture, that's a glass filled polypropylene material. Uh, this stuff is extremely impact resistant, uh, extremely torque resistant, extremely UV resistant. 
But if you were to do the same thing with PVC or CPVC, that valve body would probably snap in half. So it's important to understand the material characteristics of the thermoplastic that you're dealing with and make sure that those are applied in the correct application. Uh, that picture on the left there, that's about, I think it's uh, like 420 pounds. That's my kettlebell collection there. Um, I'm getting kind of old, so most of those don't get used, used very often anymore. But uh, anyway, that hopefully illustrates just how strong thermoplastic material can be. So the question is, why do we use thermoplastics? And thermoplastics really came into being in, uh, in about the 1960s. Uh, that's when it really became broadly adopted to start using PVC and, and that. Um, but thermoplastics have their strengths. They also have their weaknesses. But a big, uh, several key reasons why we use thermoplastics is uh, it's got a it's got a decently broad range of temperature, depending on the thermoplastic that you're using. CPVC, glass filled polypropylene, uh, glass filled polypropylene can go up to 300 degrees Fahrenheit or so. On the, on the lower end though, you do have to be careful with like uh, PVC especially. PVC can get fairly brittle in really cold temperatures. So again, understanding the limitations of the material is very key. Thermoplastics, uh, say sodium hypochlorite for instance, very corrosive chemical. Sulfuric acid, very corrosive chemical. Uh, those kind of chemicals will corrode metal whereas thermoplastics are generally corrosion resistant uh, to those aggressive chemicals. Um, metal can rust and corrode. Uh, I've got some pictures here coming up that illustrates that. Um, the, 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 in the thermoplastic material also, there's, there's nothing that will leach out of that to contaminate uh sensitive chemicals or sensitive fluids so you don't have that worry of oh my gosh i'm gonna you know material's gonna leach out of this and and reduce the concentration or contaminate uh certain chemicals and lastly on this slide here thermoplastic valves are extremely light weight so from an operator safety standpoint if you can imagine a 10 inch butterfly valve or 12 inch butterfly valve uh, it's considerably uh, safer to install a thermoplastic butterfly valve of that size, uh, safer and easier than a metal valve. But again, application, installation, process conditions, those all play into the equation. This picture here, this is on top of a membrane bioreactor at a, a local wastewater treatment plant. So just the uh, the corrosive gases that come off of a membrane bioreactor can interact with the metal, leading to corrosion and valve performance issues. And with thermoplastic, uh, we don't we don't see this corrosion happen. Sodium hypochlorite again, very aggressive chemical. Uh, PVC, CPVC, both of those withstand sodium hypochlorite just fine. Um, one of the things, and we did mention that earlier, is that you also have to factor in the elastomer or O-ring material that's used in these valves also. So when chemicals are being used in process, making sure to consult a chemical compatibility chart to verify compatibility with the valve and pipe body material and also the O-ring material is very, uh, very key. In this picture here, and I'll just mention this briefly, uh, lockout, tagout, uh, this is just kind of a side note, but um, valves with lockout, tagout, like you see in the picture there, uh, just help with operator safety, OSHA compliance, that kind of thing. And this uh, Hayward ball valve there, we've got that capability built into the valve body. Oh, and one more note on this too. So on the valve body there, you see that's all CPVC which is really well rated for outdoor applications for the most part. Some municipalities will uh, put a latex coating of paint on, uh, on the pipe and valves. 
um, that can cause issues down the line if you ever do have to cut the pipe and re-cement a valve uh, because that pipe surface has to be prepared for solvent cementing and that kind of thing. One of the things that Hayward does with our valve handles is that we use glass-filled polypropylene material for the handle because glass-filled polypropylene is extremely UV resistant and impact resistant. So over time, the ultraviolet radiation can attack the PVC and CPVC pipe uh, fitting valve material, but the, uh, the valve handle will withstand that because of that GFPP. Otherwise, if a, if a PVC material is used for a valve handle, it can become brittle over time. And then when an operator goes to turn that valve, uh, the brittle plastic can snap and then you've uh, lost control of, of being able to uh, operate that valve. Couple, uh, couple other key reasons why we would use thermoplastics. We're starting to get in the time of year when we've got a lot of heat out there. Thermoplastic material, uh, it tends to not uh, absorb a lot of that heat radiation. So you don't have to worry about burning your hand if you go to operate a valve. Um, electrically, that material doesn't conduct electricity. So that's, uh, it alleviates that concern in terms of operators uh, potentially being shocked by uh, loose wiring, that type of deal. Um, galvanic corrosion isn't an issue. Uh, we already mentioned the heat. There on that bottom line there, you can see a comparative example of uh, a four inch ball valve, plastic versus metal, 17 pounds on the plastic, 50 pounds on the metal. So you could imagine if you're an operator out in the field, um, having to do installations and maintenance and that, plastic ball valves are a lot easier to manage than the, uh, the metal. This is, a, this is a slide of a mining application. This is actually heap leach. Uh, so in this application here, uh, this is crushed ore from a mine. They're extracting copper out of this crushed ore. And they do that by sprinkling uh, sulfuric acid at I think, uh, I think it's a three to 5% concentration. Um, so these are distribution lines for sulfuric acid. The acid sprayed on the surface and it percolates down and then there's a method of uh, collecting this material and then the, the copper ions are separated out of solution. But in this application here, they use thermoplastic uh, pipe. This is HDPE pipe. The material characteristics of HDPE are extremely impact resistant, extremely UV resistant and stretch resistant. Uh, but they can drag quarter, you know, sections of this HDPE pipe, they can drag it with their tractors out there, you know, sections of pipe that are several hundred feet long, they can move these around without damaging and destroying the pipe. They decided because of the rough terrain up here, they decided to use thermoplastic uh, butterfly valves because they're just so much easier to install and move around. They're constantly having to move this acid distribution system. So making it easier on the operators was a key, uh, key reason. Uh, the, the handles there on the, uh, on the butterfly valves, again, those are uh, glass-filled polypropylene. So that material, it behaves similarly to HDPE, but very UV resistant. So you don't have to worry about that material getting brittle out in the sun and uh and breaking by comparison this is on the other side of that header system they were running into issues with uh these metal butterfly valves uh the gear operator shafts getting bent and damaged um, major corrosion because the uh, sulfuric acid was attacking the gear operators and such and so they would actually lose control of the disc on these valves so that was a big reason why they decided to convert over to uh, thermoplastic. And then this is on a, a, a cyanide extraction. So the previous one was on copper extraction. Uh, this is a similar kind of heap leach operation, but this is gonna be for gold extraction. This picture actually came out of Northern Nevada 
uh, sodium cyanide. Um, cyanide's used for gold extraction in that industry, but similar type of deal, operators having to carry valves over very unstable terrain. Uh, this is, a, I believe it's an eight inch uh, uh, valve size there. So you can imagine the strain and especially up in uh, Northern Nevada, extremely cold temperatures in the winter. So from an operator safety standpoint, uh, going to a thermoplastic, um, again, you, you got to be careful which, with which plastic you utilize with the cold temperatures there. But from a corrosion resistant and lightweight standpoint, uh, it made a lot of sense. So PVC was discovered about, about 100 years ago. PVC, if you look at that molecule, there's not a whole lot. It, raw PVC is not a workable material. There's nothing that you can do with it because it won't, if you melt it, it won't hold form. So the, the, the base plastic material, uh, there's really not much that you can do with it. It has to be blended with additives to be able to use it for anything uh, worthwhile. So PVC, CPVC, those things, we have to add things into that mix. A plastic becomes a thermoplastic when you create the capability of being able to heat that material and then cool that material. And when it's cooled, it hardens, but a thermoplastic can then be reheated again to a liquid form and cooled multiple times. Over time, that material does denature, but a thermoplastic material has that characteristic versus a thermoset plastic. Once you heat it and it cools, it's set. You can't do that. You can't reheat it again. Um, it's, it's set. Kind of a, the, the analogy is like an egg. As soon as you heat that, uh, the protein structures change form and that's always gonna be uh, uh, hardened. It can't ever go back to a liquid form. So with the thermoplastic material, the PVC, the CPVC and that, we're having, having to add uh, compounds in there to create copolymers. And that's what makes it a workable material that can be formed and shaped into something usable. So if you look at a resin, this here is a picture of, uh, I believe this is a PVC resin. So that's what raw, PVC looks like. Again, you can melt that, but there's it's not going to hold form. There's nothing that you can really do with that until you add these additives. These are the kind of things that plastic resin manufacturers add into their ingredients. So uh, especially from a Hayward standpoint, um, we're putting antioxidants in there to protect, protect against um, oxidative damage. Plastics have to have some amount of U, UV protection. So we do add in ultraviolet stabilizers. Granted, here in Arizona, we've got a massive ultraviolet uh, load that material gets um, bombarded with if it's left outdoors. So even though we add in UV stabilizers, there's so much ambient UV present that you will uh, you'll scald the surface of pipes. Um, those pipes, if they get heated too much, they can deform. So you still have to, uh, you know, a lot of the municipalities will coat the pipe with like a latex paint or that just to protect that pipe surface. Um, lubricants are added to make the plastic easier to work with during the molding process. So these thermoplastic materials, we heat that resin up to specific temperatures and then under extremely high pressure, that's injected into the molds uh, for the valves and the strainers and such. Uh, one key note, if you think about, um, say a ball valve line, Hayward makes plastic ball valves from three eighths of an inch all the way up to six inch. So we have to have molds for every single size of valve within that size, those size ranges. 
each one of those molds can cost anywhere from 250 to $500,000 kind of thing. Uh, so we have to be very protective of how those molds are treated. The lubricants that are added into those resins make it so that the molds are protected. Otherwise, the plastic can stick to those molds and damage the molds. Um, pigments are added for color distinction. You've seen on some of those pictures that I shared, uh, the orange handles and blue components and things. The pigments are also used to uh, differentiate between PVC and CPVC and glass-filled polypropylene. CPVC tends to be a lighter color, a light gray, whereas PVC tends to be a dark gray color. That's uh, kind of a standardization there. Fillers are used just to create bulk in the product. Again, we need to make it easy for that molten plastic uh, to move through the, uh, the extrusion process and that. And then there's other things uh, that are added in there just um, for manufacturing, uh, ease of manufacturing. So right now you you're probably aware if you've ever if you if you've tried to buy any PVC or CPVC recently you're probably aware that there's an extreme shortage of this resin out there. These are what the resins look like, um, either in pellet or granular form or powder form. If you if you pulled up a Google uh, satellite image of the Hayward plant in North Carolina. On site, you would see um, some railroad tracks leading up to the plant. There's multiple silos on site. So we have contracts with resin manufacturers. Uh, they deliver on site via rail car. Uh, we fill up our silos and then we pull from the, those silos. This is what that resin material looks like. But you're probably aware that right now there is a uh, resin shortage out there that's uh, creating some supply chain disruptions for uh, sourcing this material. Hopefully that gets ironed out um, relatively quickly. Uh, that's, that's really a result of a hurricane that hit a chlorine plant a couple years ago and took that plant offline. And then uh, the hard freeze that hit uh, Houston earlier this year, reducing some of the capacity of those chlorine plants there and petrochemical plants. Just as uh, a note, when it when it when a chlorine plant and chlorine is a uh, one of the key chemicals that's used in manufacturing of thermoplastics, when one of those plants gets taken offline, it's a about a ninety day warm up time to bring that plant back up to temperature. So it's not an easy on and off process for those plants. There's a long uh, ramp up time. Um, a lot of the, the resin is also sourced from overseas. So right now we've seen supply chain disruptions just with the ports of entry. Uh, from what I understand, there's, you know, all, uh, a whole lineup of cargo ships waiting offshore, uh, just trying to get their containers through the various ports. Um, you compound that with also a nationwide truck driver shortage. Um, and so you've got kind of a recipe for uh, major sub supply chain disruption. So hopefully we can work through that fairly quickly. Again, the thermoplastics, they're typically used in chemical applications, corrosive chemicals. This is a snip from uh, the Hayward chemical compatibility chart. And I really wanted to share this to give you an idea of what we look at when we're considering what materials to use with which chemicals and how concentration can change or chemical concentration can change material selection. So take, for instance, that acetic acid that you see there. There's a range of concentrations that are there. And if you look up across the top there, you've got CPVC, polypropylene, PTFE, PVC on down the line. The elastomer, so those are going to be the, the thermoplastic materials. Then you see the EPDM and the FPM and the uh, nitrile. Those are the elastomer materials. So that's going to be the rubber liner or the rubber O-ring. So you really want to pay very close attention anytime chemicals are involved 
at the con the the chemical that's being used the concentration and then making sure that you're matching up the a ratings mean you're okay you're just fine using that material b it starts to become a little more questionable c uh fairly dubious x highly inadvisable and blank it just means that there's not enough data um, to really give a concrete answer on that one of the just a quick side note here you'll also see some materials or some metal materials listed there stainless steel uh, monel titanium in butterfly valve construction it's uh, if you look at the assembly of a butterfly valve you've got a stainless steel shaft that holds that disc into the valve body uh, you may also have stainless steel lugs that are involved in the valve body too, depending on if it's a lugged butterfly valve or a wafer butterfly valve. So consideration also has to be given to potential chemical interaction with the shaft in that butterfly valve in case the O-rings uh, fail for some reason. So the, the stainless steel shaft in a butterfly valve isn't wetted but if those O-rings in the stem fail, then that metal will come in contact with that, uh, that chemical. So that's why we include that in that list there. This is a chart, uh, especially here in Arizona, that's key to understand when it comes to thermoplastics. Thermoplastics will always derate with temperature. So as temperature goes up, operating pressure drops off and it depends on the material so cp or pvc tends to drop off more most radically uh there you can see that it at um about what is it 140 degrees fahrenheit you're really dropping off um, in terms of operating temperature uh, cpvc does a lot a lot better with the uh, higher temperatures, that's a big reason why we see more of that on chemical feed systems in Arizona. If you're doing an indoor installation on say a sodium hypochlorite system, you're just fine using PVC. Anything going outdoors, you really wanna go with CPVC, uh, higher temperature resistance, better impact resistance too, if it gets hit by something. Glass-filled polypropylene, again, going back to that uh, butterfly valve with all the kettlebells hanging off of that. That's glass filled polypropylene material. A key note here is that glass filled polypropylene is not NSF 61 certified. So most of the, like on a distribution system where we're dealing with potable water, drinking water, PVC and CPVC are NF 61 certified materials. So you can use those in potable water systems. Glass-filled polypropylene is not. So it's typically, even though it's really good for uh, high UV environments or high uh, temperature environments, it doesn't carry that rating. With any of the thermoplastic, well, and really any material, all materials that are engineered have ASTM codes associated with them. AFTM is American Standards uh, Testing and Materials, I believe is what that stands for. And that really relates to the material characteristics of that material. It's a defined classification so that we know how that material behaves in certain environments. So, uh, you know, this gets into the material type, impact strength, tensile, tensile strength, elasticity, heat deflection, those kind of things. So like as the example there, PVC, uh, one, two, four, five, four, uh, that's one example there. If we look at the ASTM codes for Hayward ball valves and really um, any of the, the thermoplastic ball valves that are used in water treatment, wastewater, uh, that's typically ASTM D1784, uh, cell class 03. So all of the, uh, any manufacturer of thermoplastics is going to have a published specification 
that spells out or defines the ASTM code for the product that's manufactured. So if you were to look at the spec sheet for a Hayward ball valve or butterfly valve, it's going to state that ASTM D1784 classification. This slide here just uh, talks about some of the material characteristics, uh, the testing that's done to create those ASTM codes. Uh, tinsel strength is is a key one. We need to know uh, we need to know failure points of materials so that is these sections of pipe and valves and things are installed out in industrial environments. We know how they fail. Uh, you can see CPVC holds up a little bit better than PVC. PVDF, which is a very expensive material, uh, holds up um, a little better than CPVC. Uh, one side note here is that on, on chemical feed systems, cost comes into play heavily also. CPVC material is a lot more expensive than PVC. So especially on the, the engineering side of things and, and also installers, contractors, being aware of the price difference between those two materials, very key to understand. But when you jump up to PVDF, that material can be like 10 times the cost of PVC. PVDF is extremely resistant to a whole range of chemicals, but the cost is pretty extraordinary. We do see PVDF used like on odor control systems at wastewater treatment plants. Uh, there's uh, ferric that's used um, for the odor control process. It's a really nasty chemical. PVDF is a nice choice. Uh, these are typically on like half inch, one inch uh, pipe diameter lines. It's not a high volume chemical that's used, uh, but that PVDF material gets really expensive. Elasticity too, we want to know how that material uh, is going to perform or deform under load and stress. So again, this is part of that ASTM definition there. You can see um, how those different materials relate from an elasticity standpoint. This is one that uh, comes up a lot. We're starting to see the temperatures climb pretty substantially here in Arizona. Um, flex, if you could imagine, say, a two-inch pipe uh, or a two-inch valve in a section of pipe or even four-inch or such with a, an actuator on that thing, um, those actuators carry a lot of mass. Those will turn the valve open and close, but those have to be uh, supported and that pipe has to be supported. Otherwise, especially as temperatures climb up, that pipe can really start to sag. Um, so we want to make sure that uh, even though this thermoplastic material is rugged and industrial, that it's well supported and that flex strength and such is taken into account so that material or uh, equipment is well supported so the pipe doesn't uh, get damaged um, just by being supported out in the sun and, and under the, the weight of mechanical equipment. Impact strength too, uh, those, those who have been out in the field and seen some of the operating conditions that this material gets exposed to, uh, you know, operators having to work around this equipment and that, you know, things can happen. Pipe can get bumped by equipment, um, you know, maintenance carts, trucks, hammers, whatever it is, there's the potential for this pipe to get hit by equipment last thing that you'd want is for a corrosive chemical um, for pipe that's distributing corrosive chemical to break under the impact of a piece of equipment um, that's a big reason why schedule 80 material is used out in the field versus schedule 40 thicker sidewalls but impact strength is key so that we're not breaking pipe and having uh, leaks of harsh say sodium hypochlorite or whatever um, leaking out into the environment. We're trying to contain sensitive, aggressive, corrosive chemicals. 
And then uh, thermal, thermal expansion too, this comes into play a lot. If you're doing any kind of installation where uh, you're going from say a section of metal pipe and transitioning to plastic pipe, understanding the, the thermal expansion differences under temperature load, uh, this plays into uh, uh, just making sure that as pipe is installed, um, metal is going to expand thermally at a different rate than plastic. So that has to be taken into account anytime you're doing a material transition. Usually what we say, like if you're transitioning from a metal pipe to, uh, to plastic pipe, before you go to a, say a plastic butterfly valve or plastic ball valve, there really needs to be a spool piece of about 10 pipe diameters of plastic before you go from a metal section to a plastic valve, just because of that thermal expansion that comes into play. Heat resistance too, uh, we don't wanna be scalding hands and things like that. So uh, thermoplastic material does a really good job of not uh, absorbing a lot of heat. Uh, so it's not gonna get as hot as metal. A lot easier on operators when they're out in the field working with this equipment. Abrasion resistance too. On most of these chemical feed systems, it's all clean chemical, so it's not too big a deal. Uh, you may get into applications that has entrained grit or uh, dirt, solids, that kind of thing. Abrasion resistance comes into play. The thermoplastics are typically recommended for clean fluids. The thermoplastics don't typically handle uh, abrasive applications particularly well. That's an area where, uh, where metal tends to outperform thermoplastic material. In some of our basket strainers, for instance, uh, you may have a, a CPVC basket strainer vessel, but inside of that vessel will have a stainless steel basket so that as that fluid comes into the, the basket strainer vessel, um, any grit, any entrained uh, small rocks or grit or anything, it's gonna hit the stainless steel basket before that fluid moves through and interacts with the, uh, the plastic vessel. And then flash ignition, uh, this is a big deal. Um, thermoplastics are very, very toxic when burned. Uh, the last thing that you want to do is ever be around any kind of plastics that are burning because those are extremely toxic and uh, can cause severe injury or death. So understanding, uh, you know, when, when plastics are in, installed into indoor or outdoor applications, especially indoors, being aware of potential ignition points and that kind of thing, uh, but just keep a close eye on that. You never want to inhale uh, smoke from uh, burning burning plastic. Flammability rating too. Uh, CPVC as it burns is actually safer than PVC, but again, we really don't want to be around that kind of uh, uh, material as it's burning. So, but again, this is uh, one of those factors that plays into that ASTM code. A lot of, a lot of times in uh, indoor applications where there's the potential for flame, CPVC will be used over PVC because it's safer when it is exposed to flame. Just a, uh, a snapshot of um, minimum maximum or max operating temperature. Uh, we saw that um, pressure temperature curve chart earlier. So this just kind of rehashes that for the PVC and CPVC material that we run into most out here. CPVC tends to perform better in these high heat environments that we're in here in Arizona. Most of, the, most of the applications that we're gonna be working with in terms of water and wastewater, we're not gonna be involved in these chemicals here, but just know that for acids and bases, you've got material preferences depending on which chemical um, you're gonna be uh, utilizing and which plastic 
um, you're going to be utilizing there. And having access to that chemical compatibility chart, that's always the, the key thing to go to um, anytime you're working with uh, chemical fluid, consulting the chemical compatibility chart to make sure that everything checks out. And that's PVDF there. This is, uh, this is a key slide here. Um, on most PVC and CPVC systems, these are going to be solvent cemented. So PVC and CPVC, those systems, you can use the primer and the cement to uh, uh, assemble those systems. Those tend to work just fine. You can also use flange connections on valves and such. Um, but in terms of installing those uh, uh, piping systems together, solvent cement, that term glued is a little bit misleading because uh, when, you're, when you're using solvent cement, it's actually not gluing the material together. What happens is when you put that purple primer on there, it's softening the material and then you apply the solvent cement and you're actually creating a molecular bond. So it's not, technically it's not glued together, it's uh, chemically welded together, you could say. So if you were to do a cross-sectional, like take a section of pipe that's been cemented together, and if you were to use a bandsaw to cut that, you'd see that that material actually blends together because it's a, it's a molecular bond there. On sodium hypochlorite systems, there has been some adoption of heat fused systems. Uh, these are going to be like fusion piping systems. You cannot do fusion piping systems with PVC or CPVC unless the end connection is a fusion piping connection. But PVC and CPVC cannot be fused. That material, it just doesn't work. On sodium hypo systems, if you're if you're doing a fusion system, it has to be the polypropylene, polyethylene, PVDF material, and there's specific machines that are used to do that fusion, uh, uh, the fusion process. Just one quick note on the glued or solvent cemented systems, highly recommended that you reach out to the solvent cement manufacturers. Hayward's got a really good uh, partnership um, with IPS Weldon. So Weldon does a phenomenal training class and I don't believe there's any cost to it, but they'll come out and do a training class on how to do proper solvent cementing. Uh, they'll do a full training class in class and then you go out into the field and do uh, solvent cementing on a small, they call it a coupon piece, but then they take that piece, they take it back to their facility, they hydro test it. And if your piece passes uh, at the pressure rating, you actually get a certification card that shows that you're certified to solvent cement up to a particular pipe size. So yeah, IPS Weld On, I think Spears does it too. Highly recommended that folks reach out to those guys and, and do that class, very beneficial. Uh, just in terms of uh, assembling pipe there, different material types, schedule 40, schedule 80. That's how you can do your, uh, your joinery there or what, what it's available there, what it's available in. Schedule 80 pipe material, the PVC and CPVC, that stuff can be solvent cemented together. Just understand that the larger the pipe diameter that you get involved in, the more difficult it is to solvent cement that material together. It's not just a matter of manually, uh, you know, with your hands forcing that material together and holding it. As you're getting up in pipe diameter sizes, you're having to use chain and come alongs and such because there's a, uh, as you, that, that solvent cement, as you slip a piece onto a section of pipe that you're cementing together, that solvent cement will actually push back and try to, try to push that piece off. So you have to use chain and come alongs and stuff to keep that together. 
and then there's associated hold times and cure times uh, that that material has to undergo in order for that molecular bond to, uh, to be created. And again, going back to that idea of, of reaching out to the solvent cement manufacturers, they can provide all that training that gives you really good hands-on uh, and in-class explanation of all the cure times and the different solvent cements for particular chemicals and that kind of thing. Because each, each chemical will have, say for instance, sodium hypochlorite, there is a specific solvent cement for sodium hypochlorite. So not all solvent cements can be used on uh, different chemicals. There's uh, sometimes the instinct to just grab a solvent cement and, and just hurry and do the cementing process, but you gotta make sure that you're using the correct cement for the application for the chemical. PVC, CPVC, these are the two most common that we see in the municipal industries, threaded connections, flanged connections, and solvent cement. Anytime you're dealing with socket, uh, socket fusion or butt weld, that's where you're dealing with the HDPE, the polypropylene, and PVDF. Elastomer material, uh, that's the O-ring that you see there. We talked a little bit about that. That O-ring is what creates the sealing surface between the plastic valve body and the plastic pipe connection. Plastic on plastic will not create a seal. You will leak. Um, so you need an elastomer O-ring to create that seal. That right there, uh, the brown material there, that's Viton. Uh, Viton is a trademark name, so you may see the term FPM or FKM used. Those are the generic names for Viton. Way less expensive than using the trademark material, but chemically the same thing. Uh, the brown O-rings, again, that's Viton, FPM. If it's black, it tends to be EPDM. Consulting the chemical compatibility chart is absolutely key when it comes to uh, those that elastomer O-ring material. Just finishing up here, I wanted to throw out a few more slides of different installation practices. Here you can see uh, a transition point from stainless steel piping into uh, a short run of plastic there. Uh, thermoplastic, this is a PVC butterfly valve with a gear operator in a metal piping system. That one's gear operated in the foreground. In the background, you see uh, uh, manually operated butterfly valve lever handle. Usually the gear operators, those are going to be used on larger diameter valves or valves that are installed up high um, where you'd utilize a, uh, a chain wheel on that installation. In this picture here, you can see this is, I believe, a 12 inch diameter butterfly valve. Uh, so elevated about 12, 15 feet off the ground, you've got a chain wheel for easier operator operation. Hayward also makes uh, thermoplastic strainers. We saw a couple pictures of basket strainers earlier. We also do inline Y strainers. This is a duplex basket strainer here. So uh, duplex allows for a uh, process to stay online continuously. So one vessel is in operation, one vessel is in standby mode. So as the one in operation gets plugged up, you can divert flow to the other one so that you're continually online without having to shut down the process. And just uh, finishing up here, Hayward, again, we're a US-based manufacturer. Manufacturing is done in Clemens, North Carolina, but we've also got a massive brand new distribution warehouse in Phoenix. This is off of uh, Buckeye Road over on the west side of town. And uh, this is where we keep a huge amount of inventory for West Coast logistical support. So if you've got projects that are requiring Hayward uh, ball valves, strainers, butterfly valves, filters, any of that. Uh, we keep a really good inventory here. And Hayward is here to support uh, the AZ Water Association and, um, and all of the applications out there. And anyway, really appreciate everybody's time. And, uh, and let me know if there's any questions that I can answer.
Thanks a lot, Wes. That was <clears throat> very informative. Uh, I don't see any questions out there. If you think of a question, um, you can email any of the staff at the at the yeah, the water distribution committee uh, um, board or I didn't see Wes's email, but if you post his email, you can email Wes any kind of questions that you may have. Um, next month, I don't think we have a topic set, so that's in flux. Uh, once we get something set, we'll send an email out to the members and we can uh, let you know what, what's coming up. Again, if you see something that, or if you know of something that you want to uh, have a webinar on, please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. Um, or maybe if you have comments about past webinars, you know, uh, any feedback is good feedback. Um, otherwise, uh, thanks for coming and have a great day. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you, everyone.